Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Christine Pasco, and I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing Accelerated Technology Laboratories. Today, we're going to be talking about the importance of data integrity with LIMS, as well as tools and best practices. Data integrity, what, what does it really mean? It deals with consistency. It deals with accuracy and precision. Um, it deals with having a audit trail for changes to data. It deals with making sure that the data is maintained in a state that can be um, accessed in the future and that the data hasn't changed. Today, um, we're going to be talking about the vast amount of data that's generated in, in the United States. Um, this year, 2020, it's estimated that 1.7 megabytes of data is going to be created every second for every person on the planet. Um, it's just mind-boggling the amount of data that's generated. And that deals with the data around the globe. And if you focus on the analytical laboratory, the data acquisition in that space is also growing at a very quick rate. There's going to be a few learning objectives today to this presentation. Um, one is understanding the importance of that data integrity, what it entails, what it means to a business, and then also learning how LIMS and automation tools can facilitate good data quality and, and data integrity. Finally, understanding um, the ramifications when you don't have a good system in place to manage and maintain a high data quality and data integrity. And then we're going to take a look at a few examples. Okay, uh, data integrity, what does it mean? Why is it important? Who, who should care about that? And then to bring it to into reality, looking at some case studies in the U.S. and India as well as in China looking at opportunities and, and tools for data integrity practices. Again, we're going to look at laboratory information management systems, instrument integration, as well as enterprise integration with systems such as SAP or ERP systems, financial systems, positive ID, which refers to barcoding, or RFID, one-dimensional one or two-dimensional barcoding. And today, more and more um, people are looking at remote monitoring devices rather than humans to do the monitoring and just to save cost and also to increase accuracy. Now, if we look at the term data integrity, it refers to generating, transforming, maintaining, ensuring accuracy, completeness, and consistency of that data over its life cycle, and also compliance with the regulations that impact that data. We see more and more organizations moving away from paper and Excel sheets to electronic data. And if we look at the transformation by region, we can see that Asia Pacific and Europe, um, Europe especially 62% are looking to move to electronic systems, Asia Pacific 57%, and America 41%. So there's a real strong push to moving data to an electronic format. It just makes sense because not only it produces higher quality data, but it reduces the carbon footprint. You eliminate paper. The data is uh, easier to access when it's electronically available. You're able to perform um, analytics on that data, whether it's in a data warehouse or a, a data lake, so that you can also apply uh, artificial intelligence to that data. Now, if we look at um, data integrity, it can actually be a state or a process. If we look at the process, this typically describes measures used to ensure the validity and accuracy of that data set that's contained within a database. For example, error checking or validation methods. It can also be referred to as a data integrity process. Now, if we look at data integrity as a state, this defines a data set that's both valid and accurate. One um, statistic that I saw was 40% of businesses report losing tens of thousands of dollars because of poor data quality, and that's that's not good. We need to fix that as a as a country and as uh, analytical laboratory managers. Now, if we look at data integrity as the process, there's domain integrity, the constraint on the individual value, the check constraint. There's entity integrity, looking at the entire table with primary keys and unique constraints. There's referential integrity, where the data must exist in another table, so that if someone were to go into the back end of the database, 
whether it's um, Oracle or SQL Server, and try to delete um, a the piece of information, because that information exists in another table, they would receive an error saying, you're not allowed to delete that data because it's linked to this other information. And again, um, bad data is, is not good for any organization. It's often the result of duplication, or maybe there's missing information, or there's incomplete information, or also incorrect information. I once worked on a, a project where a client had over 25 years of data to be migrated, and they had that data in a LIMS. Unfortunately, that LIMS did not have referential integrity. So when we were looking at all the data to be migrated, we found thousands and thousands of orphan records that just weren't linked to anything. So there was a lot of dirty data that needed to be cleaned before it could be migrated. Data integrity involves the state. Um, these are technical controls as well as procedural controls, such as standard operating procedures, um, extensive use of sensors so that the data can go into a database electronically. And these could be thermocouples that are associated with uh, refrigerators, fr uh, freezers, incubators, so that you have continual monitoring. And that monitoring can go into a database, perhaps that average, the maximum min for each day. Uh, instrument integration so that there's no need for someone to manually copy and paste information from um, the output from that instrument into the limbs. It can all go in electronically. And today, many of the modern instruments allow the limbs to send a work list of samples to be run to the instrument. The instrument can be loaded, the um, analysis can be executed, and then the results are sent back to the limbs without any um, need for any humans to retype any information. It's all electronic, and it's very fast and accurate. Enterprise integration. If uh, the LIMS requires, for example, specifications from a database such as SAP, those specifications, when they're updated in SAP, can actually be pushed to the LIMS either on demand or on a schedule so that the LIMS has the exact same information that's in the master database of specifications. Another uh, key is having educated employees that understand why things are done the way they are done and making sure that they follow the SOPs. Later on in the presentation, we're going to see a few examples of what happens when SOPs aren't followed. Um, I was just joking with one of my sons that they put mulch in the, the garden. And before we put the mulch down, we need to remove all the weeds. And I told them, in my SOP, you can't just grab the weed and pull it because the roots are still there. You need to get a shovel and dig them out so that you know the weeds are gone. So when you take shortcuts, sometimes you have problems downstream. So it's really important to have solid SOPs in place and then make sure that everyone's trained on them. And then also to verify that training through a quiz or some other means that they can prove to you that they've understood the SOP. And then also managing and maintaining those training records. Um, and having a company culture that supports uh, data integrity, quality, having a quality management system, and also one that initiates correct actions uh, ready to tackle so that there's a culture of continual improvement. And also these these laboratory environments, they really require management buy-in and support throughout the project. It's not just a one-time commitment, it's a continual commitment. Now, many of you have probably heard of the acronym ALCOA. Um, it, it, um, it means that data is acceptable. It should meet certain fundamental uh, elements of quality whether it's collected or recorded electronically or on paper. Um, it's based on the 1999 FDA guidance. And decisions rely on data being both attributable, legible, contemporaneous, original, and accurate. As companies get um, more and more automated systems with computerized systems, the fundamental, fundamental Alcoa principles are satisfied by automatically generated audit trails. So having electronic systems really ensures that a lot of these controls are in place. If we dive a little deeper, you see that Alcoa is attributable, 
it basically is asking who acquired the data. Here are the analyst's initials. What's the analyst's name? Is it legible? Can you read and understand the data? I've often looked at um, field data that's been collected by um, either people working out at a plant and manufacturing environment, and oftentimes the writing is very difficult to interpret. It's like, was that a seven or is that a one? So it's really difficult when you don't have good data that you're re-entering into another system. Um, contemporaneous. Were the records documented at the time of the activity? Were, um, and the nice thing with computers is it automatically uh, captures date and time stamps of when the action was executed. Is it original? Is this the first recorded observation or a verified true copy of that data point? Is it accurate? It, it, this is, is the result scientific valid and error free? So these are the key characteristics of Alcoa. And then a few additional ones that have been added over time are complete, which means is all the data or including any reruns that were done um, linked to that sample point. Um, is it consistent? Are all elements of the analysis date and time stamped? Are they in the correct sequence? Um, is it enduring? Is the data recorded in a permanent, maintainable form throughout the life cycle? So is the data in the database, is it backed up? Has anyone checked the backup to ensure that it's still retrievable? And then is the data available? Data is ready for review, inspection, or audit as long as that record exists in the database. So these are just a few things to think about when you're collecting data. Now, the truth about data integrity failures. Oftentimes, people think about failures and they think, oh, there's a villain to blame. And in fact, in a study that was conducted by M. Dole in 2016, presented in a workshop um, in London, um, what was found was that 80% of data integrity breaches are unintentional. They're either linked to performance and business pressures, uh, a lack of awareness or capability. Maybe the um, instrument, no one turned it on. Um, integrity is not completely integrated into the culture, so there's not support from upper management, and there's not really an environment where people feel safe to question. Perhaps it's adequate inadequate processes and technology. So that really ties back to not having a quality of DI or data integrity. With the following actions, though, companies can begin to build a culture where data integrity is at the forefront. And this is through education and communication, making people understand what the uh, impacts of poor data quality are, understanding and detecting risk. And this goes back to education when people understand and some of the risks and why they're doing what they're doing are more apt to follow SOPs. But defining a strategy for data integrity and technology, and this is basically back to training, um, making sure everyone is aware of technology that is to be used, how it's to be used, as well as making everyone understand um, the importance of gathering high quality data and if there's a problem to um, if a result needs to be audited, understanding the steps of that audit, um, establishing a governance structure for data integrity. So all of these actions can really help a company move in the direction of higher data integrity. Okay, let's look at some compromises in data integrity. So if 80% of data integrity um, going back is unintentional, that means that 20% is intentional. That's a fairly high number. So if we look at some of the unintentional ones, human error, whether malicious or unintentional, um, transfer errors, this is a lot of people copying and pasting, um, maybe pasting into the wrong cell. Bugs, viruses, malware, hacking, or other cyber threats are a continual um, issue for IT departments. Compromised hardware, such as a device crash or a failure, even a disk crash. Physical compromises to devices. Um, since only some of the compromises are adequately prevented through data security, 
the case for data backup and duplication is really important. Oftentimes, people will have a backup of a database and they realize that their database is corrupt or there's a problem, and they'll go to the backup, and that's also corrupt. So it's really important to have checks in place to ensure that you're protecting your data and that it's um, in the exact format that when that data was collected. Now, if we look at um, input validation, there's some things that can be done to um, make sure that bad data isn't entered. So with input validation with a database, for example, if you want to collect uh, date information and you want the date information to be month-month um, and then a year, maybe a four-digit year, you can leave that many spaces on the form. And we have all seen this when we've entered credit card information into um, our screens for whatever we're ordering online. Um, that's a great example. So you're not going to get um, you may get raw information, but it'll be in the right format. So it's just one way to ensure that the data quality is is maintained. So you're not eliminating all errors, but you're eliminating many. Um, error detection, data validation to identify errors in data transmission. Um, there's also electronic tools that can do text at either end, making sure that um, if, if X number of characters were sent, X number of characters were received. Um, access control, this can be done with LIMS and other electronic systems through privileges and permissions and user roles. You know, data encryption, this is very uh, important when data is transmitted from, from the LIMS into the cloud for clients that are using software as a service environment so that in transit the data is encrypted, at rest the data can also be encrypted. There's a lot that can be done to ensure that data is protected. Okay, case studies. This is um, one area where I think it really makes the data integrity come to life. If we take a look at a few case studies, the first one I want to talk about is the one at a food testing lab. This is a Delaware cheese company. The FDA went into their laboratory and they saw significant sanitation deficiencies. They had found leaks in the roof that was actually um, leaking rainwater on the equipment onto the process, um, and the impact of their equipment being dirty and not following, um, they're saying they were following their S SOPs, but not actually following them, it led to contamination of the, the, the bacteria called Listeria monocytogenes, and the FDA found it on all of the surfaces. The impact that this had were that a total of eight people were infected, five adults and three new newborns, and this is the people they were able to find. They're it could be more. Um, so it's really important when you you know have an SOP in place, follow it. Um, Cane milk tragedy in San Luis. This is from China. This is really horrible in terms of its reach. If you look at this study, um, there was a urologist in in uh, China that saw four babies within ten days with kidney stones. That's not something normal for for infants. And um, he, he was very suspicious that something was going on. And then very, very quickly, a national disaster was unfolding, and six infants um, died, and over 300,000 babies were sick because they um, were drinking contaminated milk. So it was very interesting because melamine was being used to increase the um, protein levels of the nitrogen test in the milk so that it would look like it would meet the nutritional requirements when in fact it was it was painted with melamine and what happened was um, there were more than 100 lawyers that were volunteering to represent the families and the Chinese government declined uh, to take on any cases and hear any individual suits. Um, instead, the Chinese government, the Communist Party, they basically um, decided to handle it and the chairwoman for San Lu uh, was given a life sentence for failing to stop the production and sale of the tainted milk even after they were made aware that it was dangerous. And there were several other executives that received prison sentences between 5 and 15 years. A dairy farmer and a local supplier who were actually um, the ones that distributed the tainted powder to San Lu were both executed in late 2009. So it's it's very serious. Um, it's a very serious situation. 
what happened? Um, national standards, no one really uh, wasn't required to test for melamine. No one had anticipated that milk producers would doctor the supplies with this chemical. So it wasn't a test that was normally done. The normal testing that was done looked good. Everything passed. So this is a, um, an example of kind of the villain where things were added that shouldn't have been added. Uh, there were, this was um, the San Lu only began testing for melamine in late July after realizing that pet food laced with um, melamine had killed pets in the United States earlier. So it was, it was very sad because they were finding levels as high as 2,560 milligrams per kilogram, and the tolerable intake, according to the U.S. Um, FDA, was six milligrams per kilogram. And one of the impacts is, you know, 10 plus years after the milk tragedy. Parents still don't trust any of the local formulas to give to their children. Uh, there's a culture of, of poor data quality. Um, there are two Indian pharmaceutical companies that actually fired workers after the facilities received warning letters from the FDA. Uh, operators and technicians in a number of Indian and Chinese manufacturing facilities from 2014 to 2017, who during an FDA site inspection, reacted to auditors' requests by pouring samples down the drain, shredding documents, removing memory sticks, and running away with them. Um, so it's, it's just really shocking what can happen when people aren't following the SOPs of that organization for each product. Um, and as late, document shredding was noted by the FDA as recently as last year in a warning letter that cited deficiencies at a facility. And it's really sad because a lot of the um, foreign facilities are manufacturing pharmaceutical products, um, food products, um, toys. I mean, it's just everything. And all these have specific safety testing that they are supposed to go through before they're imported into the U.S. Uh, the quality department of one of the big pharma over-the-counter drug subsidiaries in the U.S. whose manager is strong-armed quality analyst into failing testing failed batches. This department, they were joking, it was called the Easy Pass. And then at the end, six senior managers were sued um, for the failure to fund adequate QC testing. Um, and I thought of that saying, you know, you can pay me now, you can invest in the tools and the technologies, a lens, employee training, automation, or you can pay me later, a fine of $22.9 million. That's, that's a huge settlement. That could have purchased quite a bit of automation. Um, there was a case in 2014. There was a Dr. William Thompson, a psychologist at the CDC, who worked on the um, MMR vaccine, measles, lungs, and rubella. And they published a paper, and they found that there was data where they had a subset of African-American boys who apparently had a higher autism rate. And he confessed 10 years later, after this occurred, burning that data um, and then coming forward um, and, and telling telling what he did and he actually had copies of that data. So it's very sad. And then we don't even have to look far. If we just look uh, the past month or so, CDC COVID-19 test kit, um, lab protocol failures at the COVID-19 test from the CDC. So FDA actually um, audited the CDC, and what they found was that two of the agency's three labs in Atlanta, um, and they were creating the test kits for COVID-19, um, were sending ineffective tests to nearly all of the 100 state and local public health labs uh, in the U.S. that were faulty. And this resulted in contamination. Um, the major problem was that the researchers entered and left COVID-19 laboratories without changing their lab coats. Uh, this resulted in the contamination of tests sent to public health labs, making them unusable. Uh, the CDC did not manufacture its tests consistent with its own protocol. So again, someone wasn't following the SOP. And this was from an FDA spokeswoman. As a result, the manufacturing problems with the test, the CDC had to delay the launch of a nationwide COVID-19 detection program for a month, and the United States lost ground in its fight against COVID-19. So it's very serious when, when SOPs are not followed. Now let's look at electronic data integrity issues. Um, files, and these are just, you know, 
a few that I found going through the literature and some of these cases that we've discussed. Files were saved to a personal computer. They weren't backed up. They weren't on a network. Uh, users were sharing passwords to save money on software licenses, or there was just a culture in the, the laboratory that everyone could use a, a user's password that had higher permissions than another user password. Um, the audit trail function was disabled. Um, HPLC integration parameters were changed and reran until the result passed. Now, they did not have an electronic backup. Unsanctioned sample testing was labeled, such as demo, test, blank, or trial, so that that testing could never be linked back to any sample. Inadequate access controls, roles and privileges were not configured properly. So there are cases where people have the proper tools, but they're not using them in the proper way, either due to malicious behavior or lack of training. Um, users logged in with a shared account to, to change data. So there's a lot of, you know, just because you have an electronic system in place, it doesn't mean that you're automatically going to have high data quality and data integrity. There's a, a huge component to that is the analytical laboratory culture as well as the training that's provided to the team. Um, raw data integrity issues. No raw data for sample solution preparations and sample dilutions. No raw data for sample weight, so there's nothing to trace it back to. No raw data for sample preparation standards. Again, there's no traceability. Destruction of raw data that did not meet specification. Missing data. Rewriting data on laboratory notebooks uh, without having any ability to audit that or auditing that. Invalidating data and retesting without a laboratory investigation. So many of these things are just, you know, bad practices and again, not having a culture of data integrity. Now, if we look at some examples of data integrity issues, if we kind of dig deeper, um, data supporting, if we look at quality control, data supporting test results were miss, was missing. Um, repackaged failed product without the understanding of the impact of the failure and then re-releasing the product, the repacked product. And then having a good test um, result from one batch and using that batch to release others. Um, releasing product with no contaminants. And in the sample area, samples not available yet, but yet there were results recorded for those samples in the database. Um, unlabeled or partially labeled samples poured down the drain. Certain samples of known value were saved for testing to yield certain result. Um, look at microbiology. Observed growth on a bacteriology plate, but yet no growth was recorded. Uh, failure to perform quality control on media plates that were made internally, so you don't know if you saw growth or the plate that was created was contaminated. Um, and again, if, if it almost goes, comes back to, you know, if you're not going to do a job right, don't do it. Oftentimes, people will take shortcuts that really impact quality. False data and incubator daily temperature readings. Um, one of the nice things that is available to laboratories now are, are the automated things so that a human doesn't have to go to each incubator and each temperature every day and, and manually record it on a paper log and then maybe transcribe that into a, a LIMS or another automated system. These sensors can monitor 24 7 and alerts. We also talk about um, barcoding, the um, advantages of barcoding in that it increases accuracy and efficiency and also speed, 1D barcoding as well as two-dimensional as well as RFID. All right, electronic data integration. We talked a little bit about instrument integration, pulling in data from contract laboratories. Again, if the data is available electronically, it's much nicer to take that data and just pull it into the lens. So you don't have to have anyone retype anything or copy and paste anything. It's just being automatically uploaded. And on that upload, you can actually do some uh, data quality checking and create an error log if anything is found. So. Typically, instruments will put out a number of file formats, comma-separated value, abbreviated CSV, Excel, text or ASCII, XML, or they'll have web services that can be interfaced with, or an API, or database to database. Um, the imports can be on demand. They can be on a schedule. 
And then you can also very quickly import data from contract testing laboratories into your LIMS. Now, the advantages of instrument integration, there's a lot of business advantages along with quality advantages. Um, increased accuracy, you're eliminating duplication, you're maximizing your resources. Remember, everyone that works in the laboratory is a knowledge worker. They're very highly trained. So you want to make sure that you utilize their brain power for the things that you really need humans for, the chemistry. Um, the ROI is typically within 9 to 12 months. Um, most of the modern instruments can also support two-way communication. And also, giving employees the best tools to do their jobs results in higher employee satisfaction. If we look at data quality, um, you can basically see the entire life cycle where the limbs will accept the data from the instruments. It'll help create schedules. It'll allow people to create reports. There'll be dashboards available for real-time um, access to KPIs of how the laboratory is doing, um, printers, barcodes, um, being able to back up the data into the cloud in addition to the backup that is in the laboratory. It's always good practice to have an off-site backup. And then also leveraging mobile devices. You can also leverage remote monitoring, which are couples that can be placed in refrigerators, freezers, incubators, humidity chambers, um, laboratory rooms, and they can basically collect data 24-7, and this data can be actually saved in the database server or sent to a cloud and integrated with your LIMS. And then it can also be set up for real-time alerts to either your um, cell phone or your tablet, automated emails alerting that the temperature ranges that you have set up have been violated so that if there's a problem, you're automatically notified so that you can rectify that where there's a, a bigger problem. Another tool of technology is being able to have dashboards so that you can see in real time any issues that may be arising in the laboratory. One of the dashboards can be set up to look at um, the number of audits that each employee is spawning. So if you have one employee that has you know, 10 times more audits than another employee, it may be something that you want to investigate. Maybe it's a training issue or maybe something else is going on. So it's really nice to be able to have a dashboard. Each user can be set up to have a dashboard um, with the metrics that are important to their jobs. And then one of the newer offerings is software as a service. And it's interesting because now, in addition to having all of your data um, in the cloud, you also have a backup in the cloud. So Again, there's a lot of additional security. The data that it typically, if it's um, with a, a good provider, when the data is going from the laboratory up to the cloud, it'll be encrypted. It'll be uh, also encrypted at rest. There'll be very tight security in terms of the firewall um, so that when the data is accessed, it's very securely accessed. All right, now let's take a look at a few methods that support data integrity. What can a laboratory do to make sure that they have good, a culture of good data integrity? Well, they can execute a risk-based validation plan. Um, oftentimes, people will hire consultants to do internal audits of their laboratory, and then they'll look at areas in which they're vulnerable, and then they'll address those areas. Uh, they should also um, make sure that their suppliers, their partners, their vendors are ISO certified so that they know that they have a quality management system in place, and they were audited by a third-party um, agency that is expert in conducting ISO audits. Um, they can examine the audit trails. We talked earlier about um, creating an audit trail report so that if there's one user that's spawning a significant number of audits, you can talk with them and understand if it's a training issue or if there's a problem with an instrument or for something else. Um, making sure that they have a, a change control process in place that everyone is familiar with so that if changes are needed, they're um, documented and people are trained on the new process. Um, quality IT and making sure that IT is included so that they know which systems to back up, how frequently to back them up, um, that if there are systems that need validation, they can come in and assist. Um, it's also very important to have a business continuity plan. Um, if something comes up, um, such as a pandemic, how are you going to continue working? 
Um, luckily, in our virtual world, many people can become remote workers. Um, with the laboratories, if you have certain, I know uh, many of the folks I've talked with have shifts, so there'll be different people in the lab at different times. Um, supervisors are able to review reports online because everything is very, um, very automated. It's easy to go virtual. And then also provide data integrity training for the team. It's, it's very important that end users are trained. Most people want to do the right thing if they understand what they need to be doing. And then it's also important to make sure that um, data that's archived and backed up is also checked. Does the, did the backup um, generate accurately? Um, oftentimes people will be making backups for years and then when they need it they find out, oh, we weren't backing up everything that we thought we were backing up. So that's another thing that's important to consider. And in summary, backup data can be very dangerous and it can be very costly. Automation significantly enhances data quality. It can eliminate transcription errors. It can really force regulatory compliance. And this is for things such as keeping track of not only employee training records, but instrument calibrations, repairs. It can prevent data from going into the limit if the instrument is out of um, calibration, if an employee's training has expired. Um, it provides a unique identifier for each sample that is logged in. It tracks each container. So there's a lot of control over the information to ensure that good data is coming into the system, along with filters that can be put in place. So that if you're looking for uh, a date, you can find how many um, placeholders you're looking for. Um, you can limits in. So if you have a pH, you can have an upper and lower limit of you know, 14. So no one can accidentally type in pH of 21. And then also ensure that data security is in place. That users have been signed roles and privileges and permissions to what they can do within the system. Um, oftentimes an analyst can enter and review data, but they're not allowed to validate. The supervisor is often required to validate that data. Uh, the cost of data, bad data, can really um, hurt business. It can shut them down. It can hurt their reputation. It can put them out of business. And it has lasting consequences in causing serious harm or even death. So it, it's really important when you're working in the laboratory to understand the impacts of the data that you're collecting. And today we're hearing more and more about data lakes and analytics and artificial intelligence. So it's more critical than ever that the data that's uploaded into these larger databases is of good quality. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.